Well, I guess I can get started. <laughs> People come in, they'll miss the the uh, essentials. I can see it online. You're already in front of the door. No. Well, as long as you guys can hear, then I think somebody <laughs> open door is more inviting. So that's true. Then again, I don't know. If they see the empty chairs, they may run away. But thank you for coming, all <laughs> three of you. <laughs> um, so this panel is obviously starting and running conventions, uh, and so these are kind of my credentials. <laughs> like, who is this guy? Why should we listen to him? Well, my name is Patrick Delahanty. I created AmyCons.com and FameCons.com. This is my. Uh, 142nd convention, and uh, I'm the founder of Anime Boston, the Providence Anime Conference. May it rest in peace. And I've staffed five different conventions, um, multiple, multiple times. You add that up, it's over 50, so I've staffed, I guess, a third ish. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, why start a convention, because if you do that, you're crazy. Uh, researching before you start the convention, starting up, planning it, and promoting it, common mistakes, and then some statistics that I've gathered. Um, so, why start a convention? Well, you might want to start one if you have too much free time, <laughs> uh, or if you enjoy having a personal life, can't get enough stress in your life. You would love answering the same questions over and over. <laughs> I know it's your favorite thing. <laughs> and you love having people complain about everything you do. <laughs> everything is your fault. Uh, but th seriously, there's reasons you shouldn't start a convention. So if you want to start a con, uh, make sure it's not one of these because it's not going to make you rich or famous. Uh, not just rich and famous, rich or famous, <laughs> neither of those. Um, because they're very expensive to run. So you're not going to be rich. And uh, usually whatever money comes into the convention goes right out. And if there's any money left over, it pays for the next year. Um, good help is really hard to find. Um, most conventions are desperate for staff. I, I don't, I, I'm assuming you guys are too. We'd love to have more staff members. And uh, there's already a con within driving distance of every major U.S. city. So it's not like, well, there's no con in my area. There is. <laughs> Plus, there's already one con on every weekend in the United States. Even Thanksgiving weekend, which at one point nobody would touch. And then people are like, oh, well, nobody's on this weekend. Let's take it. <laughs> OK. Um, Additional wrong reasons to start a convention. Um, one, there's no cons in, and I've actually heard all of these. There's no cons in my town, and their town is a tiny little thing. It's like, well, I'm not surprised. And you know, they may have 50 people, so it, it's more like a meetup. But okay, but they've got these grand plans for I'm gonna have the next anime expo. Uh, or there's only one con in my town where that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, or uh, one was started in Philadelphia because uh, the woman's daughter couldn't get to Otakon. So, I can't get to Otakon. So we're starting our own convention. It was a terrible failure. <laughs> they booked a ton of guests, didn't have anybody come in, uh, so they couldn't pay for those guests. And, yeah. Um, or. I want to meet this specific guest. <laughs> I'm going to start a convention just so I can meet that person. And that's happened, whether it's for Vic or for somebody else. Um, also, fandom is popular, so fandom will be huge. And maybe a Tumblr. <laughs> um, maybe Tumblr fandom, they think it's going to be a huge con just because. Uh, poor Dash con. They, they did not know what they are getting into. Um, and, uh, yeah, everybody is starting up the My Little Pony conventions. The, oh, this is huge. I'm going to start one. But there's so many My Little Pony conventions. Um, and, and the final reason I 
that here is that there's another con near me, but it sucks. And people that start up conventions because of that reason, we, we call them spike cons, because they don't like that con, so I'm going to start my own, it's going to be better. <laughs> um, it's really not a great reason to start a convention. Uh, as Greg Ayers says, uh, if you don't like something about a convention, before you start complaining, campaigning, threatening people, changing the guest lineup, or anything like that, try volunteering instead. And what that means is find the con near you and make it better. Um, so before you go and start your own convention, if you decide this is going to be something you want to do, uh, first thing to do is visit existing conventions. Uh, you want to see how they operate and take note of what works, what can be improved, and uh, also visit conventions outside your area. Maybe uh, your local area is too focused on what happens in that circle, but you can get some really good ideas by going somewhere else and saying, oh, nobody in my area does this. I'm gonna bring this idea back and, uh, and introduce this and have something different in my area. Um, and don't just visit the conventions, but volunteer. Uh, even if you just a gopher or volunteer, whatever it's called. Um, because once you're at that level, you get kind of an inner and look at the inner workings of the convention. You can see how it operates, and uh, you get to see what it takes to build this from the inside. Uh, you can also meet other people with con experience who can help you start your own con. Other people, because uh, you can't do it all yourself, you need other people, and this is a great place. They like conventions, they like whatever that convention's about, so they may want to do more volunteering. And as a plus, you get occasional perks for volunteering. Maybe it's t-shirt, food, a place to stay, and uh, so that's not, that's not a bad thing. Um, and after you've taken the step of volunteering, I recommend that you actually staff a convention yourself uh, because the, uh, the, the experience you get doing that is a perfect building block to be able to run and manage a convention on your own. Um, you also, as I mentioned, as a volunteer, you get a peek at the inner workings, but as a staff member, you get to see even more uh, the, the volunteers they're busy checking badges or hitting play on the DVR. They might not get to see all the planning, but st on staff you get to see the planning and uh, preparation. Um, you also meet even more experienced people, and so there's more people you can bring into your fold to help uh, make another convention. Uh, and then uh, using that staffing experience, you can also see, is this something I really want to do? on an even crazier level. Because if you're staffing at one level, but you're running the convention, it's two different things. Uh, do you have a question? Or, okay. <laughs> uh, and also, before you start a con, um, boy, <laughs> before you start a con, talk, to, talk with other convention organizers. Um, especially in re recent years, this started to be a breakdown and it's not so much competition anymore it's more collaboration realizing we're all in this together we want to build up one large community and, and not cause rifts and have separate events so that's why going back to what i said earlier you don't want to start a spike con you want to work with uh, expand the community and not cause a rift that, that doesn't help anybody um, so when you decide this is really something you want to do, and you're, you're committed, this is, I'm going to start a convention, I'm that insane, um, you have to realize that you can't do it alone, you're not Superman, because uh, everybody needs help. Iron Man needs the Avengers to help. Superman needs the Justice League, or the Super Friends, or the Super Powers team. <laughs> but you need a core staff. You need uh, a group of people that you can trust uh, who can help you get this off the ground. Um, so before you get anything going, before you sign any contracts, you need that core group of people to make sure that there's at least a handful of you that are just as insane 
because if you can't get that core group of people, you're probably not going to be able to get enough for a convention. Um, so, for staffing, <laughs> uh, before you even get dates and the location, you want to try to get people involved. Uh, and so the good way to do that is, uh, well, you have to find people who are have these traits. If you're trustworthy, reliable, experienced, and wealthy. <laughs> now, wealthy is kind of optional, but you do need start money. So if everybody is completely broke, you're not going to be able to put the down payment on various uh, rentals or even just advertising to get the website going. Uh, you need trustworthy because th these people who are starting it, they will be dealing with contracts and money and, uh, and reliability. You need to be able to know, okay, you work on this and you need to know it's going to get done. And uh, hopefully with the experience, they'll be able to get that done. And going into that, we have to, you have to delegate the responsibility because you, you're not Superman. And even if you are, you've got this Justice League. And so you need to be able to assign the work to other people and say, okay, you're, you're an accountant in real life? That's amazing. Here, you can be our treasurer. <laughs> or you, you're a lawyer? Perfect. Look over our contracts. And uh, so hopefully everybody can share some of that responsibility. And uh, for some reason, I do delegate responsibility. But uh, you need to schedule some planning meetings and uh, and then work online beyond those meetings to, to just get stuff done either in person or online. And I've seen some groups where they'll plan it and they'll just do all their stuff in their meetings and nothing happens between meetings, which is, it makes things really slow. Or other groups will do, only do it online and never meet face to face, which I guess it's the only way to do it if you're planning between long distances or schedules don't work out right. But being face to face every now and then helps um, convey that information. And it's fun to get together. Um, so the essential staff you might need when you start. Uh, first of all, a lawyer. And whether you have a friend who's a lawyer who wants to help, or you hire one, you will need one. Um, you need somebody to review the contracts with the venues and the vendors and create the founding documents, especially if you're going to be a nonprofit or um, you're going to incorporate, you need somebody to look over that documentation, get it filed, and do everything legally. Um, before you get the contracts with the hotel, you would want to have somebody look it over. So you need or you need somebody to negotiate the rate. Like, hey, if we book this many rooms, how about if the rate is this? And generally the hotel will give you their contract and you might be able to talk them down on the room rates or the facility rates. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's room there. And so having somebody who's good at negotiation, even if they got a good deal on their last car, maybe that's a good, good sign, but uh, that helps. Um, an accountant or treasurer because you will need to pay taxes and you need somebody to keep track of all the money, where it goes, when, how much is coming in. And so somebody who really loves to keep track of their bills and you know, manage their own budgets well and loves to do taxes. And probably this is the most biggest position where you need somebody that's trustworthy. Because I've seen some conventions where the treasurer has run off with some or all of the money <laughs> you don't want to be stuck in that situation. Um, you'd also need a clerk or a secretary, uh, just somebody to take notes and keep records of meetings. So you, if somebody's not there, they can look back at the notes and see exactly what happened. Or if you need to refer back to something in the past, like, oh, when did we say that was going to happen? Hopefully the clerk will have those notes. And also, in this day and age, you need a web guru, just somebody to create a website and maintain the social media. And uh, because that is where you're going to end up getting most of your uh, attendees. That's how most people will discover you nowadays. So uh, once you've got a core group of staff, you can start thinking about a venue. 
Well, you probably started thinking about it, but now you can actually get down and start looking at them. Uh, now, the cheapest place you could find to host a convention is probably at a school or university. So if you're in an anime club at a college or a high school, you can probably get free space from that educational institution. Uh, and hopefully they'll allow outsiders in, because you know it's a good way to promote the college. Hey, look, this college is great, or come to this high school and learn what we're doing. Um, the disadvantage is there's no hotel rooms, so you're not going to get a whole lot of out of town attendees, but you're probably a small event anyway, so it's not something you should worry about. Yes? With the school and university setting, is, would it be uncommon for them to have dorm rooms that maybe like moves? I, ha I have seen some conventions that do offer dorm room space in the summer. Uh, that's, that could be tricky because it's not a hotel, there's no maid service, and it, it depends on what the college is willing to provide. It is an option that I have seen some conventions do, but it, it's not a regular hotel where you get a full service hotel. Um, so you would, you would need to, like in your contract, you would need to be upfront be like, and Yeah, yeah, you, you might need to find somebody else to clean rooms and, and handle that stuff, which could be another expense. Right. Uh, or you could just find a hotel nearby and hopefully get a good rate with them. And, uh, usually if you talk to a hotel, for a small group you can say, hey, I, I want to make a, your hotel the official hotel for our convention over this school. Uh, can you give us, look, we're doing this cheap event. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe you can uh, give us a good rate. And, yeah, it depends how close the hotel is to the school. Um, and, uh, but yeah, a school, if you're at a school, this is a place to start, and a lot of successful conventions have started at schools. And then after they get, grow too big, they can move out. But it's, it's relatively low risk, because at a convention hotel, you could potentially promise too much, and then not have enough people to cover it, and you're stuck with bills. But if you're starting out here, not enough people show up, oh well. So it wouldn't be a whole lot of overheads so not much to worry about. So it's a good place to start. Uh, when, and then after that's successful, uh, the option is for a hotel. And this is a good all-in-one solution because you can have the event there and people can stay there. Uh, and it costs money, but hopefully if you book a lot of rooms, they'll give you a good rate. Uh, I've heard of a couple of conventions that have gotten a free ride at the function space because they filled so many rooms, which is probably not as common now as it used to be. Um, it depends on how well the hotel is doing at that time of year and, uh, and what other events, how they're doing in booking event space. Uh, I know after September 11th, they were desperate to book event space. You could get a cheap room rate and they were practically giving the function space away. <laughs> it's, like, the, it varies, it comes and goes, depends on the city, depends on the time of year. Uh, and it's big enough for all but the largest conventions. Um, it, but once you outgrow that, you have to start looking at a convention center. And uh, the thing about the convention center is that they are very obs expensive, obscenely expensive. As I'm sure you're well aware. Um, they give you a ton of space. Uh, so you've got plenty of room to, uh, to utilize and more room to grow into later. Uh, the downside is that the hotels aren't included. So if you just use the convention center, you still need a hotel for everybody to stay. And at that point, you definitely need a hotel because you want enough people to fill that convention center. And if you're that big, you're getting people coming in from out of town and they need a place to stay. Uh, I have seen some cons try to start at a convention center. Uh, usually that doesn't turn out too well, unless it's something that's already established somewhere else, like PAX can come in. They've, they've already done their Seattle events. It's hugely popular. They go to Boston for PAX East. They can go to PAX South and take a convention center. And yeah, they know they can do that. But somebody starting up at Enemy Con, promising all sorts of big guests, starting in a convention center might not work out too well. Um, so once you've picked a venue, you really, it's time to lawyer up. 
you've got to get somebody to review that contract, uh, the AV contract, any other contracts, and also draft contracts that you will send out to the dealers, uh, Artist Alley, if you're doing contracts for guests, just somebody to review and say, okay, this is good legalese, it makes sense, go ahead and use this. Uh, and then help with incorporation or nonprofit status or just any other lawyer things. Uh, if you don't have one on staff, you can hopefully find one that is a good rate. And if you're going for a nonprofit status, look for one that uh, has experience with nonprofit because they don't all do that. And having somebody who's done that before can save a lot of time and hassle in filing for nonprofit. Um, you'll also want to, it's time to rent a mailbox, uh, someplace convenient to whoever's checking the mail. Uh, but hopefully that's relatively close to your convention location. Like if, if you're here, but your treasurer happens to be in Baltimore, you probably don't want the post office box in Baltimore. Um, and you also want to sign up for the business bank account so you can have a place to put all the money that's not somebody's personal account. <laughs> and uh, before you announce the name of your convention, register the domain name. Because if you don't do that, somebody else is going to jump on it. And uh, also make sure when you're choosing the name for your convention that there's a domain that's available. Um, when we planned Anime Boston, we had two names we were considering, Anime Boston or Anime Revolution. And AnimeRevolution.com was taken. So we, Anime Boston was the better choice because not only did it tell you where, where it was and what it was, but we could have .com instead of dot TV or something, the biz. Um, and also, you're going to start playing money, so you'll need to figure out what you're going to do for taxes. Uh, because nonprofit taxes, I don't even know how that works. <laughs> That's why accountants get involved. And it's, if they're familiar with nonprofits, that helps too. Um, so, next, picking the date. You've, you've got a location. Uh, you probably have a general idea of what time of year you want it, spring, summer, winter, fall, especially if there's other conventions in the area, you don't want to be right on top of them. And so you want to be spread out as you can. So uh, holidays may be options, uh, whether you want to risk Thanksgiving weekend, which I don't recommend, or any anything in December is not great because people are distracted by Christmas. Uh, but Easter weekend tends to do well. Two of the largest conventions in the country are on Easter weekend. Uh, actually, no, two. Uh, Memorial Day weekend also has a number of big conventions, so those seem to be safe holidays. July 4th, obviously, Anime Expo is working well for them, but that's the other problem is that. Uh, Anime Expo is a large convention, so I don't know if you want to be on the same weekend as that one. And uh, like Otakon's another big one. And even if they're not in your region, if it's big enough, it may cause a problem because they're pulling in guests that you want. Or dealers, like, oh, we'd love to go to your show, but it's the same weekend as this con. Oh. Um, but most important thing about this is that you don't announce the dates until after you sign the contract. Because you don't want people to start making reservations and planning to come and you're, if you're collecting registration. Um, if for some reason the hotel's like, oh, no, sorry, it's not signed yet. We gave the space away. Ugh. <laughs> so just say, oh, coming even just spring 2017 or something. That's fine. but. Don't give people the firm date until it's actually ready. Um, so once you've done all this, you're kind of the point of no return. You've got the contract, you've got the dates, you've got your website ready to go, and you've made the convention, everything's ready. This is the point of no return. This is really going to happen because you've invested this money. It has to happen so that you can pay for the facility whose contract you just signed. Uh, so you need to start grabbing all the experienced and enthusiastic staff you can find. So not just that core group, now you really need to expand and get somebody who can do 
all the other stuff. Not just somebody who runs for the programming track, but you need somebody to run the masquerade, somebody to be in charge of panels, somebody to handle all those tasks, gaming. Um, and you need to update your website with the essential and complete, kept up to date information. Uh, you need just an about this convention, a mission statement saying, uh, we're in anime convention in this area, and we're, you know, whatever you think fits what you're doing, uh, just to tell people who you are. I go to a lot of conventions, I go to all the convention websites as I update AnimeCons.com. And there's a lot out there where they're kind of a pop culture thing, but I'm not really sure what they do. I can kind of guess from the name sometimes. Like, okay, they seem to be a little video game, but the theme looks steampunk. But they don't mention steampunk. So I don't know what to expect here. There's no pictures. So heavy, if it said on the front page, we're this. Like, oh, that's what they do. It, it's a big help. The dates, it seems obvious, but I've seen a lot of convention websites that don't have the dates on not just every page of the site, but no page on the site. <laughs> How do you miss that? I, and luckily, sometimes they have a Facebook link. And I go to that, and it has like a Facebook event thing that says the dates. No, this should be on the site that Google is indexing. So that when somebody searches the convention, it will say, oh, it's on these dates. Also, the location. Um, some conventions, particularly the, the small ones at colleges, will neglect to say where they are. They'll say, oh, it's this anime club. I, I don't know where that college is or what club this is, but you, great, your website looks fine, except you don't say where, what city and state. Uh, if you have a hotel, link to there so people can make reservations or at least get directions. Um, Pre-registration rates, uh, let people know how much it is to register um, and uh, also, let them know what it will be at the door. Uh, because you don't want to surprise people where, oh, it's only $35 until this date. But then what happens after that date, after that cutoff date? Because the price usually goes up. But not everybody realizes that. Some people, they've never been in a convention before, they'll see, oh, it's this price, okay. And they might not realize that, oh, it's, if I wait, it's gonna be higher. So let them know, here's what the price is now, here's what it will be next month, here's what it's gonna be at the door. And that is actually a good encouragement for them to register now, it's like, oh, I better register now because if I wait, it's gonna be $100 at the door or whatever. Um, programming information, uh, just what kind of programming, this is kind of like the about the mission statement, but it's more detail, like, oh, we're gonna have mastery, we're gonna have karaoke, video games, whatever. Um, staff recruitment page, because you want more staff, because you're not gonna be completely staffed until just before the convention, if then. <laughs> uh, and contact information, when somebody has questions, and it's gonna be the same question over and over, but uh, hopefully you can put up a frequently asked questions, but there will be other questions and they'll want to contact somebody. And you don't need a phone number, you don't need a fax number, just an email is fine. If you want to put a contact form so it goes to the right department, that's helpful. Um, and then links to social media so that they can follow you on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and anything else you use. And hopefully you're updating those too so that people can follow those and get updates as they come out. Um, it's now the budgeting part, which is not fun, uh, but you need to figure out where you're getting income to pay for all this. Uh, Registration is the big one, because people are just handing you money to come. Uh, the dealer's room, people will pay for the tables, the artist alley, art show, they'll pay for the space. Uh, any merchandising, sale of t-shirts, usually don't make a whole lot of money there, but it is income. Program guide advertising, a few hundred bucks, and then any sponsorships. There's not so much money there. Uh, you usually get donations of like DVDs and, and prizes, but at least that's stuff you don't have to buy. So you can have things to give out for contests. Um, but then expenses, this is a much longer list. 
Uh, you're gonna pay for the facilities, the tech equipment, oh, every one of these, and the tables, and the chairs, and printed material, uh, registration expenses. Some people forget that if you're using Eventbrite or PayPal, there's gonna be fees, and that you're gonna figure that into the budget. Uh, guest expenses, flying them in, paying for meals, um, and the staff, you, if they have shirts, uh, website domain registration has to happen every year and you can't forget to renew that. Uh, I've seen a lot of conventions that have to suddenly change their website to .org because somebody forgot to renew the .com or somebody who was on staff before left and was the only person with access to the .com. Uh, mailbox, office supplies, etc, etc, the lawyer fees, uh, and there's a lot more that I can't even list but it depends on what you're planning at the convention. But you have to figure out this budget with your treasurer and all the departments. What, how much are we expected to bring in and how much are we spending and on what are we spending on? Um, and so next, programming. Uh, now that you've, you're determining the budget, you want to figure out what exactly you're spending it on. And so you need to sit down with your staff and figure out what events you're running and what events you can do with the budget you have. Uh, and uh, obviously the different events have different budget requirements. The masquerade is probably going to cost more than running a panel. And uh, you're going to need a big stage probably. I've seen some that are just I actually see the masquerade in a room no bigger than this. They just move the tables to the side, it's at the front of the room. It was a 300 person con, so it worked. But, you know, if you've got a thousand people, you probably want to masquerade it's on some sort of staging. And, uh, video game rooms is expenses there with getting the TVs and the, the systems. Maybe you outsource that, maybe you get volunteers to bring their stuff in. Uh, and so you have to figure out how much the events are going to cost and decide if the payoff is worth the effort. If somebody wants to run this huge elaborate event that's only going to attract 10 people, is that worth putting all the money into? I mean, uh, like I know many cafes can actually be expensive because you have to get the venue to agree to let you serve food and there's all sorts of weird things with food in venues. and. Uh, so you've got to determine if you're going to actually have enough people to make that worthwhile or if it's just going to be the giant sinkhole for money. Uh, any events with alcohol, the insurance, which I actually didn't like to mention, you have to get insurance for your event. And if you have alcohol served, the insurance shoots up. The rate is more expensive. Um, a dance, you know, dance floor, lights, and all that. Uh, cosplay chess. Uh, one issue with that is if your con is too small, you may not actually have enough people to be the chess pieces. Uh, one con I was at, they, you need 32 people to play cosplay chess because they each, each cosplayer is a different piece. One con I was at only had 17 people signed up, but they went ahead with it and they just used sword props as pawns and they didn't do it the next year. <laughs> uh, but you also don't want to Plan better on your resources. Don't promise too much up front. Don't promise the event before you know what you can do. Yes? One question, you said mm -hmm. the insurance goes way up if there's alcohol, they get totally insurance. Like for here, where it's my understanding that it's available for the hotel, is that, does that increase, like so would that increase Santa's insurance? Uh, if it's available? In my experience in Boston, um, we did an event in the hotel. The hotel provided the alcohol, but our insurance, the event itself, went up. Went up. Because just because, the be yes, because our event had alcohol served, which put it into a different category. And maybe that was just our insurance company. Maybe it's different with others, but uh, it's definitely something to be aware of that it could affect costs that way. Um, so next, another aspect of programming is the guests. And you need to appoint the staff to handle all the guest invitations and all the guest contact. Uh, an issue that 
comes up every now and then is when people who are on staff with a convention talk to a potential guests and say, oh, we'd love to have you at our event. You should come up and, and some guests may interpret that as an invite. And then suddenly they're like, hey, I was invited to this. I haven't heard anything. Like, wait, what? No, we didn't invite you. <laughs> Sorry. And then it's just really awkward. And uh, so it's best to have all the guest invites come from the appropriate staff uh, and know who's been invited, what they've been promised. Uh, especially keep track of what they've been promised. So they don't arrive and say, hey, I was told I was going to get a suite. I was going to be flown first class. How come that's not? No, in writing here, it says, we promised this. So, uh, But how to find guests is usually an issue for new conventions. Uh, here's some of the options you can do. You can look at their websites, uh, find them on social media, find their booking agent. They may have several. Uh, or maybe they've done an interview with someone. Uh, for one convention, I got in touch with somebody who did an interview and said, I can't find contact info from this person anywhere. Could you please send them my information? Let, me, let them know I'm interested. And if they would like to hear more, email them. And they did, and they ended up being a guest, and it worked. Um, or you can ask other, invites, uh, other invited guests to know what contact meant. Hopefully it's people you're on friendly terms with or you've already invited because you don't want to go to some new person and say, hey, I'm with this convention. Can you invite this person for us? Not you. <laughs> it's just... Um, or you can ask other conventions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, conventions, it's good when they collaborate. And so, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If they can get you contact info for one guest, Maybe next year they'll be asking you for contact info for some other guests. It's a trade-off. Uh, and especially if you're talking with conventions on the other side of the country, there's certainly no worry that, oh, you're going to get in this, the same city as us. Uh, you can also meet them at other conventions, uh, but I don't recommend asking them if they're handled. <laughs> Hi, I'm with YadaCon, and could you come to our con? No, yeah, that's find a more appropriate, like later on, hand them a business card and say, hey, I, we're interested in having you. Um, and so, of course, with the guest, this comes the guest budgeting. And so, here's just some of the things you would have to worry about. Uh, appearance fees are becoming more common with guests. Back in the day, voice act, enemy voice actors, you could get them. No charge, you just fly them out, put them up in the hotel, feed them, they'd be happy. Now, almost every one of them is asking for an attendance fee. Uh, and it's because they, it's just the culture now. Because there's so many conventions and they're losing work going to these and a Thursday or Friday or Monday that they can't be in the dubbing studio or even weekends if it's a crunch time. And so they're, they're looking to get some of those uh, expenses back. Uh, there's still a few out there that will do cons for free. Uh, Tiffany Grant comes to mind. She, no appearance fee. And so if you're looking for Asuka from Ava, she'll do it. And she has a goal to be at a convention in every state. And I think she has Rhode Island and Mississippi left, or Delaware. So Delaware doesn't have a con. Rhode Island has no anime cons, so. Um, let's see. Uh, if you're uh, giving the guest an artist alley or dealer's room table, it could be a space that you could have sold to somebody else, so you might want to figure that into the budget. Uh, if, you have, if there's a companion or if there's a band with an entourage, uh, or you bring an interpreter, there's additional costs, and then any technical requirements, especially in the case of bands uh, or anybody that needs any you know, special thing. Bands. <laughs> Uh, and for guest selection, you want to consider the return on the investment, and obviously popular guests will increase the attendance and attendee satisfaction. And will the guest be a draw to cover his or her expenses? I mean, if you've got a Steve Blue, draw in tons of people. So, yes, that's probably, depending on his fee and expenses, that's, and people like seeing him. Uh, does the guest bring programming of value? So is the guest 
bringing in stuff that will entertain people and uh, provide people knowledge? Uh, or is the guest an active participant or a hermit crab? I've seen some that will just they do their panel and then they're back in their hotel. You never see them all weekend. Uh, then there's others that they're out there and they'll go to the dance, they're out there in the hallway wandering, and attendees love seeing those people because, oh, they're so and so, and they hang out with everybody and they're at the hotel bar later. And those are the fun guests that everybody loves. Um, now, you can save money with some alternative uh, selections. Uh, one is local guests, because obviously the travel expenses are down. You don't have to get a flight, they could even stay at home, maybe. And so for starting conventions, especially if you're at a school, look for uh, local artists or anybody else that just lives in the area, maybe authors, uh, even some fans, if a well-known cosplayer happens to be in the area, maybe they make a good guess. Uh, also some lesser known guests, they probably won't have an appearance fee, they'll just be glad to be out there and promote whatever there is they do. And also some fan groups. 501st Legion, local Ghostbusters, every, every city seems to have their own Ghostbusters now. And some of them have their own Ecto-1, it's some sort of car that's done up as their Ghostbuster vehicle. 501st Legion, they, they may come and set up a table to raise money for charity, uh, but then you've got a bunch of stormtroopers at your con, but <laughs> it's cool. Rebel Legion, if you want the good guys. <laughs> uh, now promoting your convention, uh, essential. Keep your convention's website updated. And I say website, oops. Oh, All right, well, keep your convention's website, it'll come up in a second, I think, it's spinning. Uh, keep your convention's website updated. And I say website because I mean website, not just Facebook. And conventions, some of them seem to get into the trap where they only update their Facebook page <clears throat> and you look at their website, it hasn't been updated in months. And I'll look at their, I'll look at a guest page and it's empty. It's a guest coming soon. And they've announced them all on Facebook. But the thing about Facebook is, you see the most recent posts, anything else gets buried, especially if you're posting often. And so there's no way to see who those guests are. So if you keep the cons, site listed as the main hub of information, that's where people can go to get the information. Uh, the current registration rates, when the deadlines are, artist alley information, all of that needs to be up there. Uh, also, get the convention listed anywhere that will list conventions, including my site, animecons.com or fancons.com. It's the same database, one just displays just animecons. So if you submit it to fancons.com, it'll be on everything. Uh, and then there's some other websites that list conventions. You want to be make sure that you're on those too. And just uh, even if it's uh, if you're multi-genre, there may be other sites out there. There's a convention scene website that lists some conventions. Or there may be a sci-fi listing site that would list your convention. Yeah. The, it, yeah, and there's some regional ones. Uh, and there's uh, some Reddit groups that will uh, list local anime events or sci-fi or whatever you're doing. There may be a Reddit group for it. Uh, <clears throat> also, make sure that you're on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr at the very least. Uh, you want to uh, be where the people are. And so Facebook is good for interaction with people. They can respond in a thread and ask questions there. Twitter is great for announcements. So, hey, we just announced this guest. And all the people following on Twitter will see that. But this, it's not so great for interaction. They can reply, but it's not going to really be seen by everybody. Uh, and then there's Tumblr, which is essentially a blog. So all your latest news posts are great there with all the details. Uh, now you can automatically cross-post announcements so that you don't need to post to each individually. But Facebook doesn't treat automated announcements the same as manual. So if you post manually on Facebook, it gets a higher weight than if it's just some automated tool posting. I'm not sure why this isn't loading here, but 
I can just talk. Um, now you want to, uh, you can also ask to leave flyers at local retailers. So if there's a comic book shop, or if it's if even better, an anime store, have some flyers printed up, leave it there, and hopefully anybody that doesn't find your Facebook group or doesn't have friends in the convention scene will see it at their comic shop and they'll say, oh, this is a cool thing, let me check it out. Uh, also bring flyers to other conventions and often there's a flyer table, there's some place you can leave a bunch of flyers, uh, hand them out outside the event, don't make a mess. <laughs> if, uh, if you hand out flyers, a lot of people will just throw them on the ground, so make sure that you pick them up, and if they're still in good condition, you can reuse them, otherwise, toss them. Um, visit any clubs or meetups in the area. There's cosplay meetups in every city quite often, and so even if you're not a cosplayer, check them out, bring some flyers, let people there know, hey, we're doing this thing, you should come on and check it out. Um, and then reach out to local media, uh, newspapers and uh, and TV stations, any local news websites. Let them know about your convention. Tell them that you're interested in working with them and we'd love to have them come check it out. Uh, the best case is that they do an article on your convention in advance and tell all their readers about it. Worst case, you end up just as a blurb in their event calendar, which that's still not very bad. You, you get listed. Um, you can send out press releases when there's something to promote. So if you announce your dates and location, great time for press release. Tell the newspaper, send it out to anybody and let them know about your event. You can find sample press releases online and uh, it's a good way to see what you need to put into one. You can look at other conventions that have done press releases and kind of use, don't copy it, but use it as a template and uh, See like, okay, here's the introduction, here's the news, here's the about us at the bottom, and uh, send that out. Uh, guest announcements, uh, any other notable achievements, like attendance, we've surpassed 20,000 people, we're proud to announce and we've brought in X number of dollars to the city of San Antonio, whatever. Uh, but make sure there's actually news to announce. There's one convention that's in LA, it's pretty big. They sent out a press release because they announced their weapons policy. Which, it's okay, great, but nobody cares. I mean, the cosplayers obviously care, but that's something, put that on your website? The newspapers aren't gonna print that. Anime News Network's not even gonna print that. That's, that's nothing. Um, and then uh, you wanna get listed in the local papers event section and invite those press people to attend. Uh, there's some common mistakes that, I, that I've seen, because in doing AnimeCons.com, I've looked at literally every anime convention's website. And sometimes I just shake my head, because oh my god. Uh, so something you need to do is put the name, date, and location of the convention on every page. Put it right at the top in your header. So no matter if people find it a search engine, they might not find your homepage first. So. Uh, make sure that it's on the page they're getting to first. Uh, plagiarism is very bad. Uh, there have been a few conventions out there that have copied content from other sites, and it might have been fine if they had asked first, but when a convention discovers that some other kind has copied their page, it doesn't go over well. Uh, so if you want to use something, ask. I mean, if they say no, oh well. Um, if they say yes, great. Uh, there was one convention in New Hampshire that started up as, a, as one of those, oh, my daughter can't go to Otakon sort of things. And it was promising all this stuff, like daycare for children. And uh, they copied literally every page of their website from Anime Boston's website, except for one, their masquerade page because Anime Boston hadn't posted their masquerade rules yet, they copied that from Kineticon. <laughs> but I had looked at that website, I was like, this looks very familiar, because I had written all the Anime Boston content at that time. <laughs> and they eventually, and they had announced themselves three months before their con, which not enough time to get the word out, to get everything planned, so it, was, it became a joke. 
Uh, they never actually happened because it turns out they never signed a contract at the venue. They, they've done everything. But, um, you also don't want to announce anything until it's confirmed in writing. Uh, it includes a wish list for guests. I've seen some cons will say, oh, we'd like to get, uh, we want to get Joss Whedon and William Shatner. No. <laughs> Don't announce, don't even mention guests until, don't mention them by name until they've actually signed on. Because if you start promising and they see that they're listed, uh, that doesn't go over well and you probably won't get them. Uh, Yaya Han, I've seen announced at these two conventions, and she said, yeah, I was never actually invited to those. And they probably could have invited her and got her, but because they had pre announced, She's like, no, I'm not going to, sorry. Um, and uh, after the convention's over, it's kind of skipping ahead past the convention. After it's over, update the website for next year uh, and pull down any other old content. I mean, if you, if it's a few days after the con and it still says 2015, that's fine. Everybody knows the convention just ended, it's still winding down. But six months after the con, if it's still saying 2015, people might wonder, is it happening again? Uh, and a common issue I see is that cons will start publishing uh, next year's stuff, but still have some old content on the page. So either they've got 2015 guests with a 2016 header, which kind of implies, that, oh, these people are coming for 2016. No, no, this is the last year. Or they'll have the 2016 guest with the old 2015 header. That, so when you update it, update everything or pull it down. And uh, even if it's just coming soon, we'll announce more later. Here's links to our Facebook. And join us and follow us on Twitter. Um, let's see if I can get start this. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Keynote is frozen, so. <laughs> um, more common mistakes. Uh, don't promote your convention on another con's Facebook page uh, without asking that con's organizer first, because that's just kind of intruding on their space, bad form. It's like you're trying to poach their, their crowd. Uh, make your website mobile friendly. Mobile and responsive is great. Uh, Google will actually rank websites higher if they have a mobile site. Uh, also, Guidebook is great, because thank you for using that here. I've used it so much at this convention. Um, it's a good way to get the guide on the go. And uh, start promoting as soon as you can. Don't procrastinate. Say, oh, we've got six months to promote. No, the best time to promote is as soon as you can. Uh, for Anime Boston, we started promoting 17 months. We'd, we'd actually have to tell people, no, it's 2003. We know it's over a year in advance, but yeah, it's not 2002. <laughs> And, uh, oh, yes, uh, uh, set deadlines, hold people to it, get everything out there when it's supposed to be, uh, and don't be afraid to cut ties with people on staff if they're not working out, because one bad apple can really destroy things. Uh, at one point we had an issue with the masquerade coordinator, we saw the signs, didn't do anything, and the masquerade was not great. But that was our first year, we didn't know better. Uh, second year, we brought in somebody that knew how to do the job, and so much better. Uh, but always plan for the worst, hope for the best. So figure out what disasters could happen, figure out how you're gonna solve it, and hope that it doesn't happen. Uh, figure out what you're, when you do the budget, figure out, okay, worst case scenario, how many people are gonna show up? What's the lowest number of people? And plan your budget on that number of people. But hope for the best and say, okay, but if we get this number of people, then we need to have this many program guides. We need this many lanyards and badges. So you've got to plan for the low and the high and anything in between. Yes? Is there a percentage that you would recommend based on pre-sale, like a percentage of power? I, I've seen pre-registration numbers vary wildly. Uh, for first-year conventions, they tend to be fairly low because people wait and they might not trust it. Like, is this really going to happen before I invest my money? 
and uh, so those people tend to pay at the door. Uh, but for more established conventions, it uh, you could see very high pre-registration rates because people know they're going, they want to get in there, especially if there's an attendance cap, they'll jump on that. Um, and yeah, and and some larger conventions that have the people that a lot of people that pre-register, they've started cutting out their registration rates so that it's not a really low rate and then lots of increments. It might be one or two low rates and then the at-door rate, if there is, even is an at-door rate. Uh, but as for percentage of pre-registration, it really varies greatly depending on how many, how long the convention's been established, how large it is, and, and just the region. Right up to the fire marshal, or pull it down and uh, I, I don't know if I'd want to test the fire marshal right. because they may decide, nope, it's too crowded. But you also have to figure in uh, staff, and guests, and dealers, and anybody with a badge, and calculate them into the cap. And uh, but definitely work with your venue if, and see what they think. And if you've been around in previous years. You can gauge how full the halls are, and uh, yeah, it's it's hard to determine what the cap might be, but at some point it just has to happen because you you've got to cut up cut it off because stuff is too crowded, people can't walk. It's a safety issue and it's a logistical issue too. So many people, but reaching a cap is a great thing because that's my budget. Right. <laughs> Um, and uh, I do have some statistics that I wish I could show. This. Hey, there's my reason. Quick this out. Go back in. Final things I wanted to show. This is a fascinating little chart that shows the number of anime conventions in every year, by year. 1990, there was one. It was ACON. This year, so far, in my database, 253. Last year, which is pretty complete. This, yeah, there's still conventions that I haven't formally announced or I haven't discovered. But last year, 274. Uh, the big jump seems to be between 2002 and 2003 when we were at 44 to 77, so nearly, or 44 to 71, nearly doubled. And then 2004 to 2005, shot up 30. But then it's been pretty steady. Uh, 2010 to 2011, it, it shot up 40. And yeah, it's just been huge. So the number has been increasing just about for you. Um, so I gotta wrap it up, but uh, I think that's yeah, that's uh, that's all the important stuff. So thank you for coming, and I hope this was informative and useful. And if you have any questions, you can uh, talk to me. I have to run to the airport, but uh, <laughs> uh, you feel free to email me. My email is uh, Patrick at AnimeCons.com and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.